much done that I'd really love to ask. One heart. Is there a place for the homeless sinner who has her time been kind just to say his own? Believe me. One love. One love, one heart. One heart. We're singing, let's get. And I will feel all right Saying let's, let's get, get together and, and feel all right One more thing now, let's get together To fight this holy Armageddon One love So when the man comes, there will be no, no, no doom One song There ain't no hiding place from the father of creation. Say it one love, one heart. Oh, let's get together and feel alright. I'm pleading to mankind. One love, oh Lord, one heart. song of the redeemed rising from the African plain. It's the song of the forgiven drowning out the Amazon rain. The song of Asian believers filled with God's holy form. It's every tribe, every tongue, every nation, a love song born of great choir. It's all God's children singing glory, glory, hallelujah, he reigns. He reigns. It's all God's children singing glory, glory, hallelujah, he reigns. He reigns. Oh, let it rise above the four winds caught up in the heavens. Towers of cathedrals to the faithful gathered underground. Of all the songs sung from the dawn of creation, some were meant to precepts. Of, of all, all the, the bells, bells rung from, from a thousand steeples, none rings truer than this. It's all God's children singing glory, glory, hallelujah, he reigns. singing glory, glory, hallelujah, he reigns, he reigns, it's all God's children singing glory, glory, Welcome. My name is Pastor Lisa, and I'm the pastor here of Buda United Methodist Church. We are 
So glad that you have joined us for worship this morning. The first thing we'd like to do is to go ahead and invite you to sign in. Let us know who you are and who is worshiping with you. You can do that in a few ways. You can greet others in the comments section. You might have seen people greeting one another uh, already. Go ahead and sign in there. You can like this post or this page, or you can text the phone number at the bottom of this screen and go ahead and text us and let us know who you are. A uh, couple of uh, announcements to make your worship experience easier this morning. We have posted on Facebook the uh, words to all the songs that we're going to sing. But do know that everything we sing, you'll have lyrics on the bottom if you're meant to sing along with us. We hope you're singing loudly and lustily at home. And then also there is a children's bulletin per, uh, posted on Facebook. If you have some young ones with you who might be interested in coloring or crosswords, there's something there for them as well few announcements. We are celebrating, we are in the final day of celebrating our 140th anniversary. We have taken a look over the last three weeks at where we were then, where we are now, and where we're going. Um, where we're going is today. So it's, it's been a big celebratory space for us right now, so welcome to that. Also, we are in the midst of our stewardship, our annual stewardship campaign. Hopefully, you have received a packet at home about stewardship. If you're not, you have not and you're wondering what that looks like, please feel free to contact us at the office, and we'll get one out to you. We're asking that people return their stewardship pledges by next Sunday, October 11th. And uh, you can pledge online, or you can return the, the card that's in the packet that you received. Today is World Communion Sunday, where we celebrate all the Christians around the world who are celebrating communion with us this morning. We will be celebrating communion by Zoom virtually after this service today uh, around 10 o'clock. So um, you should have received the link to do that in an email uh, this week. If you did not, it's also, I think, posted on the Facebook page in our weekly constant comment section. Please join us and continue worshiping this morning.
weather, looking back to see the paths taken, looking forward to see the paths ahead. We honor those who have gone before us, learning from their successes and failures. We celebrate who we are today and welcome the possibilities and opportunities before us. We gather to worship God, the God of yesterday, today, and tomorrow. Let us pray. God who calls us to be the church in this place and time, we come together to celebrate your presence among us in this time as we sing and pray and listen. May you awaken in us a hope for the future. May our time together remind us why the church is needed in the world. Amen. Each week as we come together, we're invited to think about the, the past week, the ways that we have stepped into God's plan for our lives, and the ways that we have stepped aside and found our own path. With that, I invite you to join me in the prayer of confession. Loving God, we thank you for your faithfulness in guiding and providing for this church through the years during times of celebration and times of challenge. We ask for your forgiveness for the ways in which we have not been faithful in the past or in the present as individuals and as a congregation. Forgive us for our sins and shortcomings. Forgive us for not loving you with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength, and for not loving our neighbors and each other as we ought. Forgive us for missed opportunities to follow you with a greater commitment of trust and faithfulness to the priorities and purposes that you intend for us. God, give us a renewed desire for worshiping and serving you. Amen. Friends, hear this good news, that Christ died for us while we were yet sinners, and that proves God's love for us. In the name of Jesus Christ, we are a forgiven people. Thanks be to God. Amen. to be with you this morning. God is good. Amen. <laughs> so this morning I want to talk to you guys about inventions. Do you know what inventions are? Oh, uh, you make stuff? You make stuff. And invent make stuff up in your head. Yeah, and then you create it, right? Um, so when I was a kid, there I got before me a couple laptops, but when I was a kid, we didn't have laptops. Um, we had a big computer that went on the desk, but like a, a, um, a regular computer with a screen and a monitor and everything, but not laptops that you could put in your lap. And then today I got these two laptops here. That's too big to be a laptop. This is a laptop, but it, yes, it's big. It's older than this one, right? You can tell because it's bigger. Oh my gosh. And pick them up. See how much different they weigh. What? Did I smash your fingers? Mm -hmm. Sorry. Feel that one? Now feel that one. Are they different? Mm -hmm. So That one's a tiny bit heavier on the back. It's a lot heavier. It's got this whole battery pack back here. And these are both the same brand. They're the same they're both HPs, but they're a few years apart. And you can see that that once they invented a laptop, they didn't keep it the same. What? Wouldn't that hurt you whenever you're sitting in the back of the bathroom? <laughs> yeah, it would be heavy. You would get tired of it over time. But, so, they decided this was a little heavy to have in your lap, right? So they improved. So they, so they improved upon it. They got the batteries to be smaller. It's lighter weight. And it's also, if we were to turn it on, it's also um, touch screen where you can touch the screen and scroll around where this one's not. Um, and so when they, when you invent something, if you see ways to improve it, you slowly improve it over time. And guess what? 
Bye. What do you have first? Um, and this one doesn't hurt as much as that. Yeah. Okay, so, and that's good, right? And so they make little adjustments because the, while these two are different and this one's better, there was, there's other computers in between. We just didn't buy them all and I don't have them all here. So they slowly improved upon what was there. And that's like us. Like, you are not the same as you were last year, right? Yeah, last year I was in first grade, now I'm in second grade. Yeah, and I so improved. you improved and you learn and you grow and you get taller and you... I'm not like I was when I was a baby. No, no. So we're, but there's another way we grow and that's in faith. Yeah, yeah. listen to what it says in Ephesians, our text today. In Ephesians chapter 2, verses 20 to 21, it says, As God's household, you are built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets with Christ Jesus himself as the cornerstone. The whole building is joined together in him, and it grows up, grows up, just like you, into a temple that is dedicated to the Lord. So when we... Uh, when we become part of God's church, we don't stay the same, so, but we keep growing. Yes? Last week we talked about when we were the church. We mm -hmm. are the church and we continue to grow as we the church. We continue to grow as the church. Yep. Yeah. And the steeple. Yeah, we become we become more what they say, uh, what's called holy. We become more holy as we grow, and we're called to grow and grow until we are made perfect, and we that is done through the Holy Spirit. So once you become part of the church, or once you are a part of the church, I mean, you don't stop, but you keep coming to church every week and learning. That's why we have sermons and so, school. And school, we have Sunday school, right? And we grow and we learn more and more about what it means to be a Christian. And that is good news, right? Because we're not, we always can trust in God to make us more like him. Mm -hmm. So let us pray. Dear God. Dear God. Thank you. Thank you. For helping us. For helping us. To grow, to grow, to know you, to know you, and to be more loving like you, and to be more loving like you. Through Jesus we pray. Through Jesus we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Listen now for the word of God from the letter to the Ephesians, chapter 2, verses 19 through 22. So now you are no longer strangers and aliens. Rather, you are fellow citizens with God's people, and you belong to God's household. As God's household, you are built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets with Christ Jesus himself as the cornerstone. The whole building is joined together in him, and it grows up into a temple that is dedicated to the Lord. Christ is building you into a place where God lives through the Spirit. This is the Word of God. Thanks be to God. Will you pray with me? Almighty God, may the words from my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable and pleasing to you, O God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. When I planned this sermon series celebrating Buda United Methodist Church's 140th anniversary, I knew a few things right from the start. I knew I wanted former pastors to be included in the celebration somehow, and my hope had been that we would gather together in person over a meal for this celebration. And I wanted those pastors here because they are, after all, a huge connection to the past of this church. 
COVID-19, unfortunately, put a bit of a damper on my plans to gather in person. So I immediately began thinking of how we might leverage our online situation. I thought, what about using those former pastors in our virtual services to help lead worship? Something we would not have been able to do if we had not been virtual. Because many of them, many of those former pastors, are leading their own churches on Sunday mornings. So as this idea of being virtual grew, I knew I wanted those former pastors, one of them, to preach the first sermon where we were then. But I vacillated on what my role should be. Should I preach where we are now, since I am the current pastor, and in the Methodist world, our appointments are year to year, so who knows what or who the future will bring here? Or should I preach where we are going? Because I am here now and hopefully helping you set the vision for where you are going. Primarily, in the end, more due to scheduling than anything else, I landed with the future sermon, where we are going. As the day for this sermon drew closer, I have felt more and more anxious. How can I preach about the future of this church when we are in a global pandemic, when a hugely divisive election is less than a month away, when the larger United Methodist Church is facing a schism, when life is completely unpredictable? How can I preach the future in this? What did District Superintendent Andy Smith call it last week. How can I preach the future in the midst of this dumpster fire? It's funny, our verse from Ephesians actually works quite well for this strange time we're in. You see, scholars believe that this letter was most likely not written by Paul. And if Paul did write the letter, it seems that he was in prison at the time. But scholars think it's more likely that Paul had recently died and one of his colleagues wrote this in Paul's style. Now, this isn't plagiarism like we think of it. It was actually common practice in the ancient world. It was a form of flattery, actually, a technique they used quite often. So not only is the authorship of Ephesians in question, but in many of the earliest copies of the letter, we find that it was not only written to the church in Ephesus, but to the churches plural, in and around Asia Minor, or in and around the city of Ephesus. Talk about a time of great confusion. Paul had recently died. These churches were leaderless, and whomever was communicating on Paul's behalf wasn't writing to just one church or one gathering of Jesus followers, like Paul did, but Whoever it was, the author wrote to multiple groups at the same time. Most likely, whomever delivered the letter was charged with reading it in Ephesus and then going on, traveling to the next city and reading it there, and then the next, and so on. Kind of like the first circuit writers of the Methodist church. Imagine, though, being one of these churches, this letter arrives, this man you've never met before. You're yearning for your connection to your leader, to others who believe. You're yearning for a word of personal encouragement, but that isn't what comes your way. Your leader, you find out, has died. You have a letter that sort of sounds like him, but you know it really isn't. And it's not a personal letter but it's more like a generic mass mailing or spam in the email world. Being a Jesus follower in ancient Rome was really hard. So just who is in charge now? Who was writing this letter? What was the plan? What would come next? Who is in charge? Have you asked any of those questions in the last six to seven months? I know I have. And the letter states, So now you are no longer strangers and aliens. Rather, you are fellow citizens with God's people. And you belong to God's household. 
Okay, not strangers or aliens. That's a good thing. Fellow citizens with God's people. I belong to God. Okay. But just what does that mean in the Roman Empire? The Romans don't recognize capital G God. They recognize many, many gods, lowercase g. So just who am I and whose am I? Last week, I had the good fortune to attend an online conference called Leadership Institute at Church of the Resurrection, the largest United Methodist church in the world. Reverend Adam Hamilton, the senior pastor of this church, was also one of the speakers, and he really hit some home runs with what he had to say about this strange time we're living through. Adam Hamilton came right out and named many of the things that have changed for us in the past seven months. Our jobs, the way we work, our entertainment, our families and marriages, school. We've had to change or adapt in so many areas of our lives. It's exhausting to think about that. But we had to change. Suddenly and immediately, things we thought were essential before, even those things had to change. And that's no less true of the church. If you had told me a year ago what worship would look like today, I would have laughed. No way. No way would we be worshiping online. No way would our church last through seven months of this. But we were in an adapt or die kind of situation. With adversity comes opportunity. God doesn't plan and orchestrate things like pandemics. But God can take a pandemic and make something good come from it. Our passage today says, the whole building is joined together in him, and it grows up into a temple that is dedicated to the Lord. Christ is building you into a place where God lives through the Spirit. That's what Paul said. And in the midst of all this, this building that you all helped build here stands in wait, waiting for all of you to come back inside. But meanwhile, Christ is building you into the church, a walking, talking, breathing church. Now, I know we all want to go back to some kind of normal, but I'm beginning to think that the longer we do this, the longer we will not go back 100%. In fact, I've seen a few articles lately with the title, There Is No Getting Back to Normal. So how do we leverage this new normal? God's got a plan for this, for this church, for us. We just need to listen and pray and faithfully step out. A friend of mine from my childhood where we we grew up together up in Vermont, she wrote me an email the other day and she said, just think, when this is all over, there'll be no more snow days for kids. If it's too slippery for the buses to go out, schools will just go online for the day. The child inside of me reacted first, oh no, how sad, snow days. They were these magical days in my childhood where All of a sudden, school would be closed, and we would get this free day to go outside and play in the fresh snow. We would go sledding and build snowmen and snow forts and have snowball fights. No more snow days. But the adult in me recognizes that kids staying home when it isn't safe is probably a good thing. I remember feeling pressured to drive to school as a newly licensed driver. I drove to school on treacherous roads because school was not canceled, but the buses were. I had exams, so I drove in anyhow. That was not smart. That was not safe. Virtual school on snow days is a better solution, an improvement. So I don't think life will probably go fully back to where we were. As Adam Hamilton asked, will we travel again? Probably, but we may not fly as often. Will we eat out again? Probably, but not quite as much. 
Takeout is so easy and convenient. There will be a new normal. Our job, our task is to adapt, to ask ourselves what must we keep doing and what must we stop doing. What is essential for us to be the church and what would it be better for us to give up? There's a book that I remember hearing about when I was in seminary called Sacred Cows Make the Best Burgers. The subtitle was Developing Change-Ready People and Organizations. I'm guessing this will come as no surprise to you, but churches are not generally known for their adaptability. Change is really hard for churches. We like things to go in ways that are predictable and reliable. But we're at a crossroads right now. With this adversity comes an invitation by God for us to see what new opportunities there are. Adam Hamilton also talked about their sanctuary that holds about 4,000 people. And when they're in person, they were holding six services per Sunday in multiple worship spaces on their campus. Six services. Even though when they looked at the numbers, the numbers show that they could really make do with two. Right now, they have one recorded online service, just like we do. So when they return, Hamilton has already begun talking with his staff, his church. Should we return to six services? Each service, sure, has its own identity, identity traditional, modern, contemporary, etc. Each service has their own community, but it requires a lot of resources to pull off six services. They're questioning whether that's good stewardship. Is it good use of their resources when they could get by with two? They're considering reducing the number of services they offer on Sunday mornings. Church of the Resurrection has also discovered that people are attending more regularly now that they can attend online. Prior to the pandemic, they had people, their people attended about two and a half times per month. Right now, it's closer to three times per month. Attending church online makes it easier for folks to do so if they're out of town or stuck at home for some reason. So they are attending more often. That's a good thing. What must we keep doing and what must we stop doing? At Buda, when we first started worshiping online, there was a scramble we had to get certain things set up, equipment, internet, bandwidth, etc. We had to adjust what day we were here on campus. So many things adapted and shifted quickly in response to the emergency. The early Christians had the same kind of crisis on their hands. Jesus was crucified. Paul was gone. It didn't look like Jesus was returning anytime soon. So what did they have to do? What did they have to change and adapt in order to keep surviving? How did their gatherings remain the same, and how did they change? What must they keep doing, and what must they stop doing? I wonder if those ancient Ephesians would recognize what church looks like today. Would, they still, would we still have what they considered essential for worship back then? Would we still be doing the same practices that would help them, that would allow them to recognize this as worship? What comes next for Buda UMC? Friends, I'm really not sure. What I know is that we have been in this time of forced, pressured, adaptive change. So it's also a very good time to take a breath and and Figure this out. Figure out what comes next. I know a lot of you have said we should keep virtual worship as an option. And I agree. I wonder what more we might offer virtually. Just from what I know, we have welcomed to worship people from Massachusetts, New York, Pennsylvania, Iowa, and California. We have had international participants from the Philippines, Denmark, and Australia. Our virtual community is thriving and well. They've attended worship and some have attended small groups. We don't want to shut that down. 
Not only that, we recognize that some of our formerly active members have been able to reconnect here online. People who were unwillingly absent because they're no longer driving. People who moved to other parts of Texas, Pflugerville, College Station, and Lubbock. We are glad you are here connecting with us once again. Welcome back. This is a good thing. Tricia Snyder also attended Leadership Institute, and she suggested maybe we should start thinking of ourselves as having two campuses for Buda United Methodist Church. We have a campus here at Elm Street and San Antonio Street, and we also have a virtual campus. But we do need to figure out how we can be in community virtually. We can keep some Bible studies online, but how can we be the hands and feet of Christ to our neighbors when they live across the state, across the country, or across the ocean? We have some short-term answers, but I don't think we're, ad- we're done adapting yet. We're making things good, but we're going to make things better. God is working in and through the challenges that we are confronting. Well, that's our virtual campus challenge, but here's another The Buda Ministerial Alliance holds an annual prayer breakfast for the teachers and administrators of schools here in Buda. It was outside last Saturday morning, and the new superintendent of schools spoke for part of it. I didn't get the numbers, but if my memory serves, he said something like 1,400 to 1,500 new homes are being built here each year. Each year, 1,400 to 1,500 people Families, move into this area. New neighbors. How can we be the hands and feet of Christ to them? Our scriptures today said, if Christ is building each one of us, each one of us, into a place where God lives through the Spirit. If that's true, how can each of us at Beauty UMC be the hands and feet of Christ to the new people who are moving into this community? What's next? What comes next for our church? I hope we can begin dreaming about that together. I want to put together a long-term planning or visioning team, a dream team, a dream team willing to take a really hard look at what is essential, what must we keep, and what must we stop doing. Now, I know questions like this tend to make people jumpy, Our answer is often a very quick knee-jerk, nothing, nothing should change. But friends, ask yourself, is that a faithful answer? Is that a good stewardship answer? Is that how God is calling us to use our resources? Is that an answer rooted in loving God and our neighbors? Or is it an answer rooted in loving our past? So I'm going to ask each one of you, each one of you, to pray about whether you're called to this task, to be part of this dream team. We need a group of people who can listen, really listen to others. Listen to the wants and the needs of the people of Buda United Methodist Church. Listen to the wants and needs of the people living in the city of Buda. And listen to the wants and needs of our growing and virtual community. And finally, most importantly, listen to the wants and needs that God has for this church. I want you to know everyone has a role to play in this dream team. Your voice will be heard by those listening on the dream team. You don't need to be on the team to have your voice be heard. But I'm asking you all to pray and discern if you are called to do the work of this dream team. Crises like we have faced this year, we can think of them as these huge hurdles that we have to make our way over. But we can also look at them as times to learn and grow. I know many of you have gained computer skills you never thought you would have. You are Zooming, you're on Facebook, you're on YouTube, You did it so you could stay stay in community with your church and your children and your grandchildren. We are a lot more nimble than we think we are. And I wonder, 
I dream about what new ways God is calling us to be the church, to be nimble in this time. Amen. Will you pray with me? Faithful God, you have seen this church through so many different seasons. And here we are now. As we begin this process of planning and dreaming, of listening hard to one another and to you, guide us in all we do. God, help us faithfully use the resources we have to shine your love into the lives of others. It's in your name that we pray. Amen. Let's walk together for a while and ask where we begin to build a world where love can grow and hope can enter in to be the hands of healing and to plant the seeds of
I've come to that part of the service where I need your help. I need your participation. We are going to lift to God all of our joys and all of our concerns, all the prayers that we are holding to ourselves right now. If you want any of these prayers to be lifted up throughout the week by me and by our covenant prayer team, please email me at the address that you see at the bottom of, of the screen. Will you pray with me? Gracious God, we come to you with heavy hearts, with hearts weighed down by all the concerns that surround us. To ease this burden, we now share these concerns with one another and with you. we raise all these concerns to you and we recognize at the same time that you do not leave us there that every day has blessings and joys that we can live into it's these joys that we lift to you now pray all these things and one thing more using the words that Jesus taught the disciples saying our father who art in heaven hallowed be thy name thy kingdom come thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven and give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Lord, you give the great commission.
And now will you receive these words of benediction. May you go out remembering the past, living in the present, and looking forward to the future, loving God and loving your neighbor. Go in peace. Amen. Jim Sweet. I served here in Buda from 2009 to 2012. Rebecca and I are currently living in San Antonio. I serve now as the pastor of Holotus Hills United Methodist Church. We are so pleased for this great milestone for this faith community. We ask that God would continue to bless you. It's great to be here this morning. And I will remind you that in everything, you should give thanks. Greetings from our retirement home in the Big Easy. Also known as the Crescent City. Also known as New Orleans, Louisiana. I am Reverend Nancy Day. And I'm Casey Taylor. We serve the good people of Beauty United Methodist Church from 2011 to 2018 and have many fond memories of our time with you all as we grew together in love of God and neighbor. We share in your joy and bring you our warmest wishes as you celebrate 140 years of ministry in Central Texas. Now, wash your hands, wear your masks, continue to pray for one another, and as Jeff Entre says, les les bon temps roule. Let, Let the, the good, good times roll. roll. count me in. I don't know how to come in. You're going to have to do this when we're in live worship. You're going to have to stand back there. We can go right into it. Yeah. Uh, praise God in whom all the blessings will flow. I know this one. <laughs> Good. Yeah. <laughs> Is that the hallelujah one? That's, yeah. Ra Ray Fong Williams. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Oh, no, I don't know that. Are you going to put the thing in between? Uh, do you want me to? I love it. Personally. Okay. The reason I like it, because it doesn't get correct. I'll yes, do it. Yes, it doesn't freeze. You know what? I'll only do it because it's like... <laughs> That's enough for me. I'll only do it because... I'll even buy you some Ben and Jerry's ice cream. Yeah. <laughs> the coconut uh, candy bar? Yes. <laughs> 